Thank you all for uh, coming uh, uh, here tonight to, to listen to my presentation. Uh, I, do I need to say anything about this? I, I have included a disclaimer that the research that I will present today has been funded by the US National Science Foundation and a number of private foundations as well. Uh, so I, I'm Italian, as you can probably tell from my <laughs> accent. I haven't lost it in many years. I've been at Stanford 19 years. Uh, if you have any trouble hearing or understanding what I'm saying, feel free to interrupt, uh, and I will plow through the presentation. But no, if you want to interrupt and clarification, it, it, it doesn't need to be sort of a formal frontal presentation. In the past two years, so I've been at Hopkins Marine Station, and in the past two years, I've had the privilege of being the co-director, of becoming the co-director of Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions, together with Jim Lip, there in the photographs. Uh, uh, Center for Ocean Solutions, it's part of Woods Institute for the Environment. Its main office is based here on main uh, main campus, and we're really aiming or endeavoring to connect uh, the research, the scientific insights about ocean and ocean health, all the way to action or impact on the ocean. And so we've been working both with scientists at Stanford and in other institutions, as well as a number of partners in NGOs and in governments and in other organizations. The, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about where these organizations are. We have projects uh, in Palau and collaborations with the World Economic Forum in San Francisco and the Food and Agriculture Organization and a number of other partners. But I'm a marine ecologist by training and my lab is based at Hopkins Marine Station. I've been there since 2001. And uh, uh, Hopkins Marine Station is right in the heart of Monterey Bay. And I'm starting with Hopkins and Monterey because this is a really great example of the kind of changes that have occurred both in ocean ecosystems and coastal communities. This area was inhabited by the Esalon and the Ohlone for thousands of years. And then uh, there was the European colonization and the development of fisheries, primarily the sardine fisheries. They thrived until it collapsed in the 1940s as a result of overfishing and uh, um, adverse climate conditions. And then basically there was kind of the rebirth of this area with the diversification of economies, tourism, science and research, and, uh, and also a number of different fisheries. So, uh, it's also an example so of all of these changes had different outcomes, both for ecosystems and people. The species that thrive differ, the people that benefit differ. And this is the story all over the world, really, where ocean ecosystems are providing a number of benefits. At the same time, they are impacted by a number of stressors. And we are seeing a real upheaval in oceans with overexploitation of resources, combining with degradation of habitats, combining with pollution and climate change, to cause major alteration and losses of diversity. And the real important uh, um, uh, fact that I want to highlight is that these stressors don't occur in isolation. They combine and they cause what we call tipping points, where the, the ecosystem reaches a threshold and then there's a precipitous change. So it's not a linear decline of diversity or productivity or resilience to climate. Often it's a step, and we have seen these steps in coral reef ecosystems. These are images from Great Barrier Reef, as well as in Arctic ecosystem and uh, uh, estuaries and coastal wetlands and a number of different types of ecosystems that see these tipping points, these, these thresholds of change. However, I want to start by talking about these narratives of ocean. How we describe ocean health and changes in ocean health is very important. And Jane Lubchenco, who is a fellow marine ecologist, but also former head of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, just published a really important paper, I think a short letter last month, where basically she calls for a new narrative for ocean. And moving from these narratives that are about doom and gloom, <coughs> precipices, collapses, losses, 
to narratives that highlight uh, the need and opportunity to develop solutions to these problems. And so basically, she describes three basic narratives about oceans. For a long time, uh, oceans have been seen as uh, basically, unex basically unexploitable. So they're vast, they're rich, they're too big to fail. And so this has per really been the pervasive narrative about oceans for a long time, up to a few decades ago, where we really didn't worry as much about oceans as we do today. Then the narrative has shifted in the past two decades or so to uh, a narrative about impacts and collapse. And the problems, you know, declining coral reefs, uh, overexploited fisheries, plastics, uh, it's really are becoming so big that the narrative has shifted to um, pervasive pessimism. The oceans are big and the problems are even bigger and they're too big to fix. And now I think the narrative that uh, James Luchenko and others are calling for is that the oceans are too important to neglect, that they're too central to other well-being, to our livelihoods, to the livelihoods of billions of people around the world, and so we really need to find those solutions. And the reason the oceans are so central is that they basically uh, regulate everything. We depend on oceans for pretty much everything. The oxygen we breathe, climate regulation, food, um, space. So uh, they really affect the well-being of the whole world. And I want to focus for a minute on one really important service, which is food provision. There are lots of people around the world that uh, really rely heavily on seafood or exclusively for protein intake. And there are countries, eight countries, that depend for over 50% of their animal, uh, of their protein intake on seafood. And despite, uh, oops, sorry, I thought, despite a really rampant increase in aquaculture production of seafood, Production of seafood from white captured fisheries has leveled off and hasn't really increased despite increasing effort for the past 15 or 20 years. And so the question remains, can aquaculture fill that gap and match basically and keep uh, meeting this, the demand, the increasing demand from an increasing population? And then the other aspect is that seafood is not just not protein or calories, but provides a number of very important micronutrients that are key to the well-being, in particular, of vulnerable populations in developing nations, children, uh, pregnant and lactating women. And so there's a function, too, of providing nutritional security in addition to food security. <coughs> However, the projections for whether the oceans are going to be able to kind of meet this increase in demand, again, are not uh, optimistic. And for example, this is an example of a modeling projection that took IPCC climate projection scenarios and developed the production model to forecast what are the expected changes in uh, fisheries catch. So this is why capture fisheries, not aquaculture, under future climate scenario. And so under this scenario, in uh, um, uh, 2055, the areas that are in the hot colors are predicted to see a decline in uh, catch, in production of seafood, of as much as 50%, so decline by half. And the areas that are in blue or in the cold colors are projected to, pre to see an increase in catch. So one of the messages from this and other analysis is what we expect is a redistribution of the catch. However, linking this back to the consideration about food and nutritional security, the areas that are predicted to see a loss in seafood supply are the areas in those developing nations that are particularly vulnerable to food insecurity. So this raises a big concern about future food security. All of these predictions, many models and many analyses that have been done to date focus on large-scale industrial fisheries. The trawlers, the long liners, that just produce many of the seafood that we consume. I want to shift and highlight, no, shift scale in a way, and highlight the, the fact that seafood production and livelihood associated with fishing 
are in a large part associated with small scale and artisanal fisheries production, for which we know much less, but that plays really, really important roles in providing jobs and food to many people around the world. It's estimated that small scale fisheries, those that are caught with small boats with relatively low technologies, often multi-species fisheries based in coastal areas, produce as much as half of the seafood sketches globally every year. They employ over 90% of uh, all of the people, you now fishers and fish workers involved in this sector. And in fact, uh, a recent paper estimated that together, small scale fisheries employ more women and men than all other ocean sectors put together. So a major source of livelihoods, including an estimated 50% of women in the workforce. When we're talking about small scale fisheries, I very kind of quickly define that they're based on small vessels, low technologies, typically based in coastal communities. However, I want to highlight that we're talking about a very broad diversity of different kinds of fisheries and different groups of people doing it. So ranging from really kind of um, uh, low technologies in, based in um, nets and spears and traps, uh, now in, in uh, some of the coastal fisheries, gleaning where we, women and people in general walk out to the flats and the reefs to pick up things by hand, so really low, um, uh, low cost and relatively low impact to more sophisticated higher impact technologies with engines and uh, nets. Despite this diversity, small scale fisheries share some common characteristics they typically have limited mobility. So where you are thinking about large vessels, big trawlers, what we're seeing globally is that they tend to track shifting stocks. For example, with warming, some of the tuna stocks are moving north. Those vessels have the capacity to track those stocks and move with the resources. However, small scale fisheries typically are kind of stuck in place, so they don't have that ability. Typically limited resources to respond to uh, uh, depletion of their resources or other changes, and often depend on species or habitats that are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climates or other impacts like coral reefs or ice ecosystems, for example. So they tend to be vulnerable. However, I to put this big and in red because this is one of my, the main messages and one of the main results of the research that I and others have done, which is that the small scale fisheries and more generally the coastal communities that are embedded in, are often not passive victims to change from global change, from climate and other changes. They have the capacity to, to influence these trajectories and respond, and I'm going to present a case that kind of exemplifies the behaviors and the strategies that the coastal communities have used to respond to these pressures from climate change, for example, and others changes and adapt and thrive. So um, I'm highlighting this paper, which is uh, led by Josh Sinner, an Australian ecologist and others, because again, it's a little of a shift in the thinking of the narratives that I think is very important as we're moving towards uh, solutions, you know, in addition to documenting impacts. So they um, published this paper on this idea of bright spots. And basically, this is again a shift from documenting impacts and investigating the drivers of these impacts to focusing on what has worked and trying to understand why has it worked, why is it different as a way of informing our strategies and our solutions. So what they did was actually a very ambitious project. They assembled data from over, from over 2,500 uh, um, coral reef ecosystems and fisheries. And basically, they looked for outliers, positive outliers and negative outliers, systems where the uh, ecosystems and fisheries, and here, for example, they look at deviation in fish biomass on the reef, are doing better or worse than the global average. So in yellow, you see those positive outliers, the bright spots. Ecosystem that despite a long history of exploitation are supporting basically anomalously high levels of biomass of fish. 
they are especially productive. And then the black are the dark spots, those that uh, considering factors in this model like the geography and the depth and other biophysical factors are doing worse than you would predict. And the reason I'm showing this uh, in addition to the thinking, which I think it's important, is also for the results. Because what they found is that these bright spots, the places that are the overperformers, are not necessarily the remote, pristine places that have no people. In fact, they tend to be places where there's a strong dependency on marine resources, where communities depend largely or exclusively on those fisheries. They're places that typically have uh, some form of physical refuge from extreme, from heat waves. For example, some reefs naturally have this cooling from deep cold water that come up and uh, ameliorate the effects of extreme ENSO events or other warming events. And they tend to be systems with strong institutions, meaning that there's uh, communities or agencies or other forms of institutions that function well in how they manage the institution. So this really brings up, uh, now reinforces the notion that when we're thinking about oceans, we should think about oceans comprising both a biological or ecological component and a human component. And so we are now often considering oceans as a whole, that includes ecosystems and people. And when we're thinking about impacts on oceans and ocean health, the need to consider how the ecological component responds to change, what are the exposure, for example, to heat waves or to ocean acidification, what is the sensitivity of those systems, how vulnerable are they, what is their potential to recover following those impacts, as well as similar dimension for people. How vulnerable are human communities to changes in their resources, for example, and, how, uh, and what is their adaptive capacity? How can they respond? And so overall, vulnerability has these two dimensions. So I'm going to shift uh, to uh, a system in Baja California where uh, myself and collaborators and students have been working for over 15 years as an example of how to look at change in ocean and ocean health using these two lenses, the human and ecological component. And the areas where we've been working is, comprises this kind of stretch of the coastline of the Pacific coast of the Baja California Peninsula, which is this magnificent place that basically is a beautiful desert on land that borders a cold, productive, diverse marine ecosystem that is very similar to what we have here along the coast with kelp forests and a number of incredibly beautiful and interesting marine mammals and other species. In particular, I show a picture of the whale because these lagoons, the um, Vizcaino Lagoon and the San Ignacio Lagoon are areas where the gray whales go to uh, uh, have their calves and they exhibit this really interesting behavior where you know, the fishers take out tourists, like myself, and when we approach the whale, the mother will pull up the calf and bring it up to the boat. And uh, uh, no, people can see them, and you make eye contact with the whales, and it's a really incredible experience. And uh, some of the communities have developed this form of ecotourism where they take people out to see the whales as an alternative or a complement to their fishing. But by and large, most of the communities, with this few exceptions of other sectors, really depend exclusively on fishing. There's no agriculture, there's no other economic sectors other than fishing. So together with the communities along the coast and a number of different investigators and organizations, we have been uh, um, both uh, studying uh, how these systems are affected and respond to changes, for especially from climate variability that, that we described, as well as supporting adaptation to these changes. So I will describe what we've done. First, however, the Baja California um, coastal marine ecosystem is part of the uh, California large marine ecosystem, of which we are also part in California. So this really rich, productive system that hosts all these uh, charismatic species, sharks and elephant seal and whales, as well as marine forests along the coast that are mostly formed by kelps, 
that range down to about 30 meters of depth and have you know, a whole uh, ecosystems associated with them, including species of commercial importance. What distinguishes, however, Baja California from the California coast uh, and ecosystem and fisheries is that the communities there are organized in cooperatives. And each cooperative was granted by the Mexican government the exclusive access to the resources in these marine territories. So this is very different from how things work in California, where it's open access fisheries with agency regulating them. This is almost a form of lease or private property. So the cooperatives have an organization, a governing body. They have elections. Um, their directors turn over every two years. So it is very interesting um, uh, governance aspect, but also have uh, exclusive access to a number of species including lobster. So this is the spiny lobster. Uh, this is the most successful fishery that they uh, have been conducting over the years, starting in the 1930s, 1940s, when they got the concessions. This uh, fishery was the first to be certified as sustainable in a developing country by the Marine Stewardship Council. How many people see this symbol in the store or look for products that are certified? Okay, so that it's a form of certification for seafood, and basically it's a kind of a way verifies that this fishery um, uh, has, a, what do you say, a, it doesn't overexploit the stocks, so that the health of the stocks is uh, uh, maintained, uh, doesn't have impacts on the ecosystem, has low level of bycatch, is caught with traps and also has uh, management that has the ability to enforce regulation and respond to uh, challenges. So this was one of the fisheries. Other fisheries are done for benthic invertebrates on the seafloor. So species like abalone, this big snail that feeds on kelp and lives on reefs, sea cucumbers, sea urchin snail, all products that are exported to Asian markets and that have, have a very high values and that they are um, collected on hookah. So this picture here shows the diver. So the diver jumps in the water and has an air supply from the boat with the hose, and there's a compression on the boat that basically pumps air down, and goes around the bottom with this bag, filling it with abalone and sea urchin, and then tags on the back, and people on the boat pull it up. And so this fishery is so valuable that uh, the price of the abalone reached the maximum of $120 per kilo a few years ago. And the uh, divers uh, are uh, not very successful and well-off people in their community. And there's a whole culture associated with diving. And every home you go in, there are pictures of abalone and divers. And so it's a very important fishery. And then finally, there are fisheries for fin fish that are not part of this exclusive right system. They're open access. And there are issues with bycatch of turtles and sharks and seabirds and a number of environmental impacts, but no ability to regulate because the cooperative doesn't have a jurisdiction on this fishery. So it's an overlap of an open access and, and uh, uh, concession system. So, so in the last years, you probably all know that this system in California, as well as Baja, has seen major climatic events. This all started in 2013 and then more prominently in winter of 2014 with what is called the warm blob or this heat wave, a warm temperature anomaly that developed with the mass of anomalously warm water of Alaska and then persisted all the way through winter of 2015 for a year, moving down the coast. That was followed by an extreme El Nino event in 2016 and 17. And so basically the water temperature had been anomalously high and nutrient poor in terms of nutrient concentration for a very long time, for almost three years. And this led to a whole number of changes in the ecosystem it's interesting to note that changes were not all in a negative direction of decline. So there were what we call winners and losers. 
So some species decline, and we saw you know, the decline and closure of the Dungeness crab fisheries, market squid in, in um, Southern California, salmon, but also some of the species and fisheries did really well, like tuna and rockfish that increased. So some species benefit, some species decline. I mentioned earlier that uh, these different stressors often combine. And so I want to bring up this example from Northern California of what some, some of the researchers have called the perfect storm of a combination of events that led to the collapse of this system. So throughout this ecosystem, there have been winners and losers and species and ecosystem that had variable um, responses to these events. But in this case, in Mendocino and Sonoma County, things added up to cause collapse throughout the ecosystem. And what happened is that in 2011, there was a toxic algal bloom that uh, produced domoic acid and with the toxicity, mass mortality of many species. Then in 2013, a viral infection resulted in mass mortality of over 20 different species of sea stars throughout the California current up to more northern Baja. These species include a species like the sunflower sea stars, this big sea star that has 25 arms, and other species that are predators of sea urchins. And so while the jury is still out on what led to explosion of sea urchin, one hypothesis is that the demise of their predators facilitated this boom of sea urchins that are now in very high abundances. They are herbivores and feed on kelp. And so that led to deforestation of kelp. And then following this event, there was the warming event. Kelp needs uh, cold, nutrient-rich waters. And the warming, the warm blob, and the El Nino event uh, shifted the conditions to warm, nutrient-poor water. And the kelp did not recover from this event. And so now the abalone and other fisheries are closed. And basically, the studies that have been done show that now these animals, uh, you know, um, the invertebrates and other species in the system, are not affected by disease uh, or by hypoxia directly, but they're just starved, basically. They don't have enough food. So similar events occurred in Baja California. Starting in 2009, we started documenting major collapses of some of the fisheries, including abalone, sea urchin, sea cucumber. Then with the warming event, the kelp forest was gone. Basically, there was no kelp. I have never dove in these systems without seeing a single hole fast, not the base of the kelp. It was just basically clean rocks and some algae, and it was completely gone for a lar large stretch of the coast. And at the time, we thought when the first mortality occurred, we thought it was a disease. Histological studies, pathological studies disproved that. And now we know after many studies that what happened, that what caused the first mortality was a prolonged hypoxic event. And basically, hypoxia manifests uh, in a drop in the oxygen concentration on the bottom. And uh, normally, upwelling events, when there's winds and upwelling of cold water, are accompanied by low oxygen condition. But typically, those are short pulses of uh, 30 minutes, three hours at the most. What we saw in these cases were persistent conditions of low oxygen, in some cases uh, at zero concentrations that lasted for days or weeks. And so all of the organisms that can't escape these conditions because they relatively, have relatively low mobility were affected. We've now expanded uh, this type of studies, these oceanographic studies that are helping us understand what environmental conditions affect this ecosystem through this project that involves community members. So all these are partners in our communities. They're fishers. We have a program for women divers that are trained in scuba diving and participate in the studies. And basically, each community now has oceanographic sensors. And they can go out and monitor conditions in their fishing ground and track change and anticipate some of these events in their fisheries. As well as, mon I, well, I'll explain this in a second. So, uh, I just want to make this little, I don't know if this is advertisement and I can do it, but this instrument is called the mini dot. 
uh, it measures temperature and oxygen every 10 minutes and it has a logger so that you can keep track of the conditions in the water. It was developed by graduate students at Scripps in San Diego. And the beauty of this instrument is that for the cost of one of the instruments that we used to have 10 years ago, now we can buy 12 of those. And so with this improvement in technology and decrease in cost, now we can move from a single buoy somewhere that misses these events to this net of measurements and basically this empowerment of local communities that can easily be trained to use these instruments and can put them out and move them around and put them in their aquaculture facilities and kind of take more ownership of keeping the pulse on the system and understanding what is happening. So uh, a few weeks ago, we had a workshop in Ensenada in Baja California with all the partners and they all brought their data. And basically, one of the results is that some areas along the coast are much more vulnerable to hypoxia. So, this is a snapshot of one year of total duration of exposure to low oxygen conditions over the 12 months using two thresholds. This threshold is what we call the sublethal threshold. In our laboratory experiment, most organisms that we test at this, below this level of oxygen show an impairment in their behaviors, in their growth, but they don't die. And then we use a more extreme threshold, which usually results in mortality. So the triangles indicate areas that saw as much as 2,000 hours underneath this legal threshold. And the circles show areas that show variable exposure up to about 4,000 hours to sublethal conditions. Basically, you see that this area to the south, these are north to south is much more vulnerable, and that throughout, there are some areas that are more vulnerable than others, and I'll explain in a second what that means. Through this monitoring program, we were also able to uh, assess the consequences of an extended, prolonged, or harmful algal bloom that affected these areas. So this is a satellite imagery. I don't know in this slide, but you see this brown discoloration. This is uh, a, a dinoflagellate, algal bloom, that persisted for several weeks in this area. And the instruments that were measuring oxygen on the bottom corresponding to this event showed that for weeks there was no oxygen in the water, a really extreme prolonged event that resulted in mass mortalities. So the research that we've done so far in the laboratory, in the field with our partners, indicates that uh, uh, hypoxia arises from two different basic mechanisms. Prolonged upwelling events that take oxygen poor waters on the coast and then it sits there because of currents and entrainment or toxic algal blooms. And often what happens is that toxic algal blooms or uh, the tail end of uh, that upwelling driven hypoxia sometimes coincide with warmer temperature. So during upwelling, temperatures are very cold. When the temperature rise, oxygen demands rise. And basically, organisms have a higher metabolism and need more oxygen, but they're still deprived of oxygen. And that's when we see most of the mortalities. And we are finding that species and life stages vary in their vulnerability. We've also conducted the participatory monitoring of the kelp forest. So these are fishers, and this is one of the women uh, groups in the communities participate in the monitoring of the kelp forest. And when now we have, uh, for some of these locations, we have 13 years of data. And uh, basically, what all of this shows, I'm going to synthesize it again, as there are winners and there are losers. The fishes, some of the fin fish species, now the kelp bass, the sheephead, and other species, actually are doing quite well under these conditions. A lot of the benthic invertebrates have been declining, and in fact, they have collapsed, and some of the fisheries are closed. In terms of how this translates in fisheries catches, we have similarly seen that there are winners and losers, and most of the economies now rely on the harvest of lobster that are doing quite well, and some of the algae. So there's been some compensation because uh, 
lobster catches have been maintained and lobster values has increased tremendously in the Asian markets. And so this has compensated for the loss. So economically, a lot of these communities have kind of maintained their income because of these shifts. But they have lost the diversity of products that they usually have access to. So there are winners and losers. And then another result that I want to highlight is that there are local refuges. And before I highlighted that some of the locations throughout the range see really high hypoxia and some low, that there's really spatial variability. This is really important because we found that the manifestation of these events, the heat waves, the hypoxia, is variable at a local scale. And so this results in local refuges, in fishing grounds that suffer a lower exposure to this extreme and act as refuges, and they're the engine for recovery in the nearby areas. So we have worked with the communities to establish marine protected areas and to do restoration projects, leveraging this information and exploiting these refuges to maintain and kind of jumpstart the recovery of the population. So the refuges provided a number of opportunities for adaptation you know, in the winners and losers. And these communities have progressively diversified their approaches from uh, simply fishing to conducting conservation and uh, uh, aquaculture and mariculture and restoration and uh, certification initiatives. For example, now the um, um, yellowtail uh, coat in some of these communities is featured on the a recommendation list from the Monterey Bay Aquarium for sustainable seafood. Uh, they've also you know, basically st st started to invest more in mariculture to replace the production of abalone. And so a number of uh, activities that uh, are, are kind of diversified. So I want to, uh, you know, in the last five to 10 minutes, I'm almost done, uh, I want to highlight uh, the response of the human system because we have focused a lot on the oceanography and ecology, and uh, um, briefly report on experiments that have been led by Elena Finkbeiner, a postdoc in, in the lab and at COS, as well as our collaborators. Basically, um, when confronted with this high uncertainty where as a fisher or as a fishing community, you really don't know what's going to happen next season. Are you going to have your livelihood? Are you going to do something different? People might respond in two fundamentally different ways. So one can imagine that faced with uncertainty and risk, people will stop cooperating, will stop conserving, and will basically go in the water and get the very last fish out or a baloney out. Another um, uh, reasonable logical response is that instead when there's high risk and uncertainty, there might be an investment in trying to address the problem and perhaps greater willing to cooperate and conserve, for example, to distribute the risk so that as a community um, you can face this adversity. So we have uh, kind of tested this idea and asked this question using an approach um, that is called dynamic common pool resource field experiment. It comes from behavioral economics. It's essentially a game that we play with fishers in the field where uh, fish, groups of fishers, essentially we simulate a situation where they're harvesting resources. So each of those yellow velcro square symbolize a unit of a resource, a lobster or an abalone. And then we do rounds where people play for money and basically decide how much to exploit. And then we add treatments, experimental treatments or basically rule, where we bring in a shock, we roll a dice that has 10 faces, and if five comes out, 50% of this simulated population dies. We simulate a situation where there's exclusive access rights to the resource or open access. And we're basically, rather than asking people, what would you do or what have you done? We try to understand the drivers of the behaviors and the responses in, with the experimental approach. And so we've done this with, uh, uh, in six communities with 180 fishers and the results show that uh, there are some factors. First of all, uncertainty fosters cooperation. And in fact, under risk, 
at least these communities were willing to invest in conservation to a degree that wasn't present when they were faced with steady conditions. So we find this a very interesting result and uh, um, different from what previous studies have shown. We also found that uh, what is important really is communication. Basically, um, introducing a treatment where people could communicate with each other increased this outcome where uncertainty increased the willing to conserve. And then the other factor was having exclusive rights. Uh, the uh, concessions, uh, the exclusive access, essentially is an incentive to conserve resources that are yours and are yours for periods of 20 years in this case. So it's an incentive to conserve. However, in this system and in many others, we're also finding that in the cases where the communities have limited resources. They don't have the capacity to invest in all of those adaptation initiatives to uh, give away catch by setting up marine reserves or invest in aquaculture, or where they don't have access to resources, or where they, don't, they feel they don't have agency. Basically, what they decide is irrelevant because, for example, there are uh, outsiders coming in and exploiting their resource. What we've seen is that there is this negative feedback loop where basically the communities become trapped in what we call a top poverty trap. That leads to more exploitation, less ability to respond, and basically this uh, um, scenario where the ecosystem is de degraded and the community is impoverished. And then in other cases, as I have highlighted with the experiments and the case studies, there's a positive feedback loop where there may be some constraint on the action that can be taken, but measures are taken and overall both the economies and the ecosystem has been improving over time. I want to touch on three emerging themes that are kind of follow up from this research and things that we're interested in pursuing at Center for Ocean Solution, which are information, the development of aquaculture and scale. So first of all, uh, I have highlighted how uh, oceanographic information, knowledge about what markets you can sell to, is really important in adaptation. But we want to expand uh, this set of questions by investigating the role of technologies in, support, in empowering and supporting adaptation in fisheries. There are a number of technologies that are being developed, like trackers that allow um, communities to enforce regulation, to detect illegal activity, to monitor the effort in their fisheries. And so it's really important to understand how we can scale some of these examples to impact. The other uh, um, really important emerging theme in all of this research is that more and more coastal communities are looking to aquaculture as the solution. This is happening globally, but also at the local scale. And so in the communities in Mexico, in China, in Africa, in many of the communities where we work, there has been either through government subsidies or through investment of the communities themselves, a commitment to developing aquaculture to basically fill in the gap from declining fisheries. And so this uh, uh, brings up a number of issues and questions that need to be addressed. And this includes uh, um, uh, rights, for example, in the case uh, like in Mexico with the concessions, uh, those that develop aquaculture are sometimes infringing and overlapping with the rights of the fishers, and this is happening in other places. So aquaculture can be a means of strengthening the rights of the local communities, their access to spaces, but can also lead to conflict and competition for space. So it can play out in two different ways. Uh, aquaculture can bring in income and seafood, but can also compete in the marketplace with some of the small-scale fisheries products, and so in some cases has displaced the fisheries from the market. And then also aquaculture is not immune to the risk and impacts from disease and climate change, and so this investment also comes with risks because in some cases the whole uh, operation can be lost to diseases. And then, so there's a lot of questions that we want to explore. And then finally, a question of uh, uh, scale. The uh, communities and protected areas and, uh, and uh, um, interventions that I discussed uh, are minuscule. So this is Baja California. Uh, 
and basically these are the kelp forests, right? They are the rim. And you now there are large amounts of oceans that need to uh, be conserved and maintained. And uh, um, I want to highlight this example of uh, perhaps uh, an opportunity to bring these interventions up to a greater is scale. That real? Is that real? Yeah. So these are the rock islands in Palau. Uh, it's uh, um, a UN heritage site. It's one of the most beautiful places I have personally ever seen. And one of the best diving I've done there. You can dive on these drop-offs and you are on a beautiful coral reef, as diverse as you ever see, and then you have a drop of blue water with tunas and sharks swimming around and barracudas. I mean, you are now on the rim between these two incredible ecosystems, an amazing place. Palau, now the Republic of Palau, the government of Palau has invested in conservation and has set up coastal MPA, you know, marine protected areas similar to the ones in Baja, but now have taken a really bold step as they have uh, um, passed an act that will implement, starting next January, a pelagic sanctuary. So this is Palau. These are the rock islands like, he like here. And this is called the exclusive economic zone of Palau, basically all of the waters of Palau. And in January 2020, they will close 80% of their exclusive economic zone to fishing, large marine protected area. It's uh, over 500,000 square kilometers. It's larger than Spain. This may mean something to me because I'm European, but I always think of those. Uh, basically, it's a big, it's a re really big area. And then they are going to leave 20% open for the development. So right now, there are foreign fleets from Asia, primarily. They fish tuna and other species in this water. They will be displaced. And the water that remain open to fishing will be left open to the development of Palawan fisheries. So similar to the Mexican case, where basically you shift the benefits to local users and therefore create economic opportunity and incentives to conserve. And so this is a real interesting case of a similar thinking but scaling it to a much larger scale with an opportunity to spread even further because Palau is one of the small island nations of the Pacific, but there are many others that if Palau is successful might follow in the similar footsteps and together their waters encompass most of the Pacific from Australia to Hawaii. So a real opportunity to scale, not to spread this insight. So um, what we are learning and uh, so far is that uh, uh, small scale fisheries are diverse and they require a variety of diverse approaches. Uh, we really need to move beyond the, both uh, the gloom and doom narrations that everything is collapsing and there's no hope and also be sort of careful and cautious of the narratives that overpromise that aquaculture or technology will come in and solve all the problems. There really, there really isn't a silver bullet, but it's going to take several you know, concerted actions at different scale, at the community level, at the national level, at the global level, and a portfolio of different approaches to address this, uh, um, uh, this main challenge, major challenges, and considering what the trade-offs, who benefits, who loses, uh, what are the ecological outcomes, but also the social outcomes is key um, um, and, and should be pursued more aggressively. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, so earlier in your presentation, you had a slide of the IPCC forecast of the uh, stocks for the world. And I noticed that the hotspots where there was going to be a decline, a significant decline, was also near very dense populations, for instance, India, China, Indonesia. So my, I assume the study was based on both the, the overfishing and the fishing as well as climate change. So the question I have is, do you have any idea how, how much of that change is a result of human activity versus climate change? Yes. Yeah, so that projection, uh, that change uh, is uh, exclusively from climate. Uh, 
But those, uh, I think this is a very important point, that those same areas are also seeing a very dramatic decline from overfishing. So those, it's a conservative estimate because in many of those areas there's also fishing and those models don't account for that. They assume that fishing will remain the same everywhere and it's the same pressure. Another question regarding the same hot and cold map. Yes. Um, are those localized effects of schools of fish uh, that, are, that are geographically separate or is that a result of migration to follow temperature, oxygenation, and that sort of stuff? Yes, so that uh, is just based on uh, the effects of climate or temperature on productivity. So it's, uh, it doesn't account for migration for example, from rain shifts with species migrating to different latitudes. So that's. Could you address uh, mercury in the ocean and how that might be affecting small scale fisheries? Is it, <clears throat> for example, not as much of an issue because those fish that are being caught by these small scale communities are lower down in the uh, food chain? or is it actually a fairly large issue? I missed the beginning and I said, could you address the effect of? She wants you to address the mercury levels. The? Mercury levels. Ah, the mercury levels, yes. So I, um, I just learned about uh, this really terrifying and uh, very important very, uh, case in Colombia in uh, uh, in the uh, small scale fisheries in Colombia where um, uh, basically gold mines that use uh, mercury to strip the gold from the minerals have been pouring mercury in the coastal waters. And so uh, a colleague from uh, Colombia was explaining that they're now doing research to try to address this issue because on one hand, uh, poverty alleviation and food security programs run by the government have re been really promoting the consumption of seafood, especially for pregnant women. And uh, at the same time, they're finding that the levels of contamination in mercury are really, really high, causing the greatest problems in the pregnant women. So that is just an example of the kind of trade-offs that mercury poses, and, now, and you were asking about farmed uh, fish where you know, I presented the benefits of seafood, but there are also the trade off with mercury and other forms of contaminants. And as we are trying to develop recommendations for diets, both in terms of environmental sustainability but human health, those trade offs will become really important. And so fish farming has seen uh, um, pretty significant improvements on the practices and so the quality of fish farm, for example, salmon from Chile and other major exporters has been improving in terms of human health, but there are all sorts of other problems that remain in many of the farms, but also in coastal areas from contamination. So that, the example from Colombia really struck me because it's the classic example of really being at the loss with how to even begin to address this problem. And another one, which is uh, also related to health, uh, went back to the lack of refrigeration. In large areas of the world, and in many areas of the world, the fish that is caught because of the lack of refrigeration need to be salted or dried, or in some cases is thrown away. So there's a major amount of waste. And so they, uh, this same group of researchers found that in uh, uh, coastal areas where fish is salted, this leads to high blood pressure and an incidence of cardiovascular disease that is off the roof. So now again, where it's a source of food and livelihood in areas that uh, where there's no rampant poverty and malnutrition, but then at the same time it comes with this health impact. So I think those trade-offs are, are really important to address and I think need to be considered. Got one more right up front and then we are gonna wrap it up. I'm coming to you. First, early on you showed you know, the decline of catch. Why is the Southern Ocean so affected? The, the, uh, in, that, in that same projection in that map? 
that's a good question. I believe Uh, I believe it's, uh, it might be because it's a hot spot of productivity, and so maybe there's a disproportionate influence on the phytoplankton productivity of the warming, but I don't know the detail of uh, that model, and I'm reporting, in that case, someone else's work, and so I, it's a good question. But the, the authors discuss uh, uh, changes in productivity and how they basically come up the food web, and so that you're seeing that, and then uh, the Combined, so that is one factor. Areas that are not very productive, like this subtropical area, suffer, uh, and then uh, oceanographic characteristics, so okay. circulation. So I don't know how those two play out to affect the Southern Ocean. A few slides after that, you showed a chronology that went mm -hmm. winter 2014, 2014, fall 2014, mm -hmm. and then 2015. Was that the chronology you intended? Uh, so the warm blob uh, developed uh, in winter 2014 and kind of persisted through the winter of 2015 and then uh, sort of went into the uh, El Nino condition through 2015 and 16. I think that's, that's it. Did, that, did I get that wrong in the slide? Well, I don't know. You so, showed first, you showed mm -hmm. winter, and then you showed fall. And then mm -hmm. the next year. Yeah, I probably got that wrong in the slide then, yes. But basically, it started developing, you know, fall 2013 started seeing a slight anomaly. Winter 2014 is when it was very evident in of Alaska. And then through 2014 and the beginning of 2015 persisted. So that, that is the chronology. And then when those conditions were starting to dissipate, the ENSO conditions started uh, um, uh, coming in, and then through the summer of 2015, and then through 2016. And now we're seeing a, um, a neutral condition. So it's not a reversal. It's kind of neutral Nino, El Nino condition. But yeah, I probably mixed that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. How about another hand for Thank you.